ID. And this is going to be a clear change of gears now from Brian's talk. Um, and I would like to actually start with this quick essentials of this talk, and we have a few others that are coming. So, A, I want to show you how IPLT facilitates novel methods development. That's something that we're very keen on, how to get new mathematical ideas into the field. And the second one is how we in Basel have been using IPLT, of course, um, to do so. Now, this second part is mostly tomorrow, and this part is mostly this talk now. So, <coughs> we're wearing three hats all the time. Um, we wear the software engineering hat. And that's really stuff that most of you are very far away from and that only people like Brian or me can appreciate, you know, here we design an architecture, we think about the programming language, we develop frameworks, skeletons, low-level libraries, worry about building on multiple platforms, all these sorts of things. Then we have a methods developer hat that we put on when we derive the mathematical descriptions of our physical phenomena, we actually code the numerical implementations. So here the methods developer for me is also somebody that can program. And of course, we have to implement, test, and improve the processing schemes. Now finally, we have the structural biologist hat that most of you are probably wearing most of the time, you know, preparing the sample, collecting the data, processing the data with the software. But this is the most important thing that drives us all answer biological questions based on the structural interpretation. Now, to our dismay, but even to a greater dismay of our boss, we are wearing this hat only very little time. So in fact, over the last few years, we've been wearing this a lot, and now in the last one or two years, we've been wearing this a lot, and we're only approaching a situation where we, in our little group, can really start to think in terms of structural biology, because the rest is more or less working. So, in fact, I have maybe only two slides tomorrow concerning this. I have lots of slides now concerning this, and tomorrow there will be several now, why are we wearing all these different hats? So, this is from 2003, 2004. So, our goal was at that time to, as I phrase it, revitalize to the electron crystallography. Now, we can have philosophical discussions whether that's necessary or not, but at the time when I joined Andreas Engel, we felt that there was actually something needed to get going. Now, our strategy that we worked out then was the following. The first was a redesign of the software. We really didn't like MRC. Not MRC in terms of what the results were, but MRC in the way that it was built for software engineering. So we said, okay, let's redesign this, but let's have a look what MRC actually is doing and what um, other packages and related fields are doing, mostly X-ray, um, and learn from that. Then we decided, let's just re-evaluate all the algorithms. There's some mathematical and processing ingenuity, 30 years of experience and work in MRC, but let's just take a look again. Perhaps there are some things that we can tweak. And of course, let's continue with method development. Let's look at some new stuff we can do. Well, and then, uh, you know, we should actually solve some structures. That would be kind of important too. So now this is the <coughs> down compressed vision that we had. And um, I, don't, I don't think I want to go through everything in detail. So basically, we want to encourage development of novel methodology. We want to also facilitate the easy sharing of these algorithms. So one of the things that you mentioned, Brian, and that you also struggled with in 2DX, is people have solutions all over the place, and they have ideas all over the place. So your idea is to implement the scripts that they have and to make a convenient wrapper. Our idea actually puts more responsibility on the people. They have to recode their algorithm. Once they actually do that, it's immediately shareable by everybody. I mean, it's, it's the same goal with two different approaches. Provide a more attractive next generation software uh, for all of you that have coded in Fortran and then in C shell, um, not necessarily here. I mean, c 4 was built upon that too. It's not the most pleasant experience. Um, and then, of course, this is tailored to community requirements. There were image processing packages out there, but they couldn't deal with 10K square 16-bit grayscale images. So, Ken, you mentioned yesterday, there's this problem, uh, how to load that. We load 16K to an FFT in about a minute. Um, so, that's not an issue. And 
Um, there's a concept that comes from CCP4 that's data harvesting. So once you have this processing done, you actually want to publish, you want to pool all information into a single spot. So we sort of wanted to do that from the beginning. Um, now, this is now a few results slides how we think we've achieved this. So this is a complete overview of the IPLT software architecture. And there's a few things I would like to point out. So first of all, you see we took the decision to have two different languages. We just felt we couldn't deal with one language to do everything that we wanted. So we have here, a lot of things are written in C++, and there's a lot of things that are written in Python. Then we have a lot of modules that you see. We have here something called the base module that's really at the heart. Then we have a lot of algorithms and this X module, which stands for electron crystallography. I'll be talking about that later. Then we have a separate graphical user interface component. So it is separate from the rest of the system, still tightly integrated. All the great things you see here are libraries that we get from the web, so we don't have to code everything. And these are extremely standardized libraries available on all platforms. Then we have a few green things that are not particularly related to, um, to image processing, but are general libraries. And very important here, very thin layer, is the Python wrapper, which allows us to go from C++ to Python, and actually back in a very convenient way, and it's so transparent that if you would start using this, you wouldn't even know. Now, perhaps here it's worthwhile to point out that we are using a library called WX Widgets. We are moving to Qt, which is exactly what 2DX is using, and this move is based to a large extent on discussions that we had with Brian, and um, I think this will be an overall improvement and will move a step closer that 2DX and IPLT actually come together at one point. So let's talk about some goodies that we have that are interested, interesting for people that want to develop methods. So we have this base library where we have an image concept, and I'm talking about concept because it's really an abstract concept where we have encapsulated a state. So if your image is in the real domain or the Fourier domain, or if it's of complex numbers or floats or integers, or if it's one, two, or 3D or the pixel sampling, it's all encapsulated in the image, so you never have to worry about that. There are some helper classes. There is an uh, algorithm concept, which I'll explain below. Then we have a very nice, fully featured geometric library. And there's all these nuisances, you know, you want to do a vector matrix multiplication. Of course you can code it by hand. I've been doing that a lot, you know. You should, you should just reuse code this. Then we have here a solution that's completely different from what Brian showed you. We actually use XML, and we love XML. But for the programmer, using XML is actually a major pain, because it's so generic, used all over the place, um, from databases to web servers to whatnot, that we just created a very, very thin layer that takes the best from XML, but you never know that you're dealing with XML. And uh, this gives us a very powerful possibility to actually store and retrieve parameters. And in my talk tomorrow on diffraction processing, I think I have a better explanation how that works. Then we have uh, input-output, and we can read pretty much all the common formats. I mean, we even sat down and it's, uh, somebody here, so from the town, we even reverse engineered the, the digital micrograph format. That was a one weekend hacking session at home, which I enjoyed very much. It's a really, really bad hack, completely undocumented, but we can read EM3 images and pretty much the rest of the rest. Now, we also handle big and little engineers automatically. Now that everything is uh, Intel, probably doesn't matter, but if you have some stuff from SGIs lying around. Plus, thanks to a recent visit to Ken, who gave me very ancient data from uh, the VMS, we can now even automatically convert that floppy point format. Um, the size is only limited by the virtual memory, so 16K by 16K is absolutely no problem. Then we have a whole bunch of sort of generic algorithms that you need. I mean, these are your typical boilerplate algorithms. There's nothing special here about them. Then, moving closer now to electron crystallography, this is, I would call this more the toolbox. The other was the library that's lower level, now the toolbox is higher level. What things do you have there that you could use? Well, we have all the essential classes encapsulated that you need, you know, typically, let's say the tilt geometry. You will hear, I think, tomorrow from Henning that this tilt geometry is actually a headache business without end, with lots of conventions, with lots of confusing names. And I just got sick and tired of thinking about it every time I use the tilt geometry because I'm an extremely lazy person. So I just encapsulated it all in a class, 
never have to worry about it again. Then I really have to stress this point when you go from images to reflections, and you have these lists of reflections. The CCP4 package has a very powerful format called MTZ. And we have a very nice wrapper around this MTZ file which you can load, manipulate, and save. <coughs> and I dare say it's not even more comfortable than the MTZ util or MTZ down tools in CCP4 themselves. We have taken from CCP4 the complete symmetry library, so we have all symmetry operations available. If you want to symmetrize a reflection list or ask what are the symmetry related points, etc. Again, encapsulated wrap, you don't have to think about it, you can just use it. And we have this really, really extensive algorithm collection that forms the, the heart of our uh, methods development. So, CTF simulation and correction, Fourier mouse Then we have a very sophisticated lattice search, even extended to multi lattice search and refinement algorithms. We can search distortions in the lattice, basically what fault searches do. We can do the unbending, so what unbending is doing. We can integrate the peaks. This is either for only amplitudes or extract the peak and the phase, um, some weighted binning and some exponential fitting here. Um, if you interact with the program, there's basically two ways. You have a command line IPLT, and this is batch mode, so there's no graphics there, which means you can just submit a job, let it run for hours on end, you can even log off the computer. Then we have the graphical version, which is everything that you have here, plus you have a lot of graphical libraries at your disposal, which I have a few slides further on. And finally, this is a little jiffy, um, it's just called eye to eye, and you give it an input and an output image, and the C++ program, I think, is five lines. But it's extremely powerful because from the extension, it just opens the image and saves it in another format, so it's a very convenient image converter using all image formats that we have in IPLT. And this is, is, is actually for us trivial, but I realize that a lot of people need that all the time just to convert images. Mm -hmm. Right, so the graphical user interface has only been growing for the last I would say one and a half, two years. We were so much focused on functionality and new methods that we sort of forgot that most people approach a program in the graphical user interface. And basically we suck. So we could never demonstrate why IPLT is so great because people couldn't look at it. You, couldn't, you can't show the code here. I mean, if I show you our class library, which a software engineer, you know, would maybe drool over, you would all be bored to death. So we have been building up some, I, some GUI goodies we have, for example, a built-in graphical Python shell. So interactively, you can do it on the command line or in the Python shell. We have a data viewer with a very flexible overlay capability. And all of you that will join tomorrow afternoon in the um, diffraction processing exercise, you will be confronted with this and our very sophisticated interactive graphics fitting. We have an extremely powerful plotting facility. So one of the things we were really annoyed about is writing our PostScript or, or reading stuff into the various um, plotting packages. Because if we develop methods, we want to do rapid prototyping, we want to quickly look at the results, and this exporting takes away valuable minutes or hours. So in the end, we just wrote our own, and it's been an indispensable tool. And it's straightforward to use. In fact, it has nothing to do with image processing. And uh, the main author is Andreas Schenk, and we've been thinking of just putting this on, on, on SourceForge. Um, you can build your own GUI really rapidly with WX Python, and this is really independent from the rest of IPLT. So you not, never have to worry about. It. You can program scripts that don't use the GUI, but it's still tightly integrated. So if you want to use it, you have all the functionality available. So I have now a little movie that just shows this that just shows this um, lattice manipulation. And it will go fairly fast, so I want to highlight two features. The one feature is, and you will be also using that tomorrow, that the spots are fairly hard to see, so here is one. So this, there will be one spot fitted here. You have the possibility to, I think, control shift, and then when you drag the spot, it does an automatic 2D Gaussian fitting constantly. And if it comes close to the spot, it snaps it. But not just with a pixel, but with a really nice Gaussian fit. That is one nice feature. The other nice feature is you will see here a green highlight, and after a while the other spot that is fitted will also be marked green. And that means these two points will be fixed. 
So if you manipulate any other lattice point, internally we're constantly solving the equation for a lattice and actually adjusting the lattice so that those two points that you selected don't change. And that really helps to sort of tweak the lattice because it's a known problem that you change something here and something there goes slightly out of register again. So that said, let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, so first there's a slight rotation of the lattice. You see we have the editable lattice highlighted um, in a lighter color, so you can always reject it. So there was the snap into that point, then you accept that lattice, and then we uh, zoom in to this one here. And now these two are fixed, so no matter what happens here, those two won't change. So again, there it's snapped in, so you can move the mouse around a little, it'll, it'll find the sub-pixel centering, and that basically within a few seconds, you'll fit your lattice. And we'll be doing that tomorrow some more. Um, right. Now I want to explain some of the other nice things in terms of code. So I know that some people, if, if you haven't programmed, this might be a little daunting to begin with, but I want to point out the following features. We use English commands. I mean, you have to sometimes type a lot, um, but I would think that if you read through here, you actually understand what is going on, even if you have never programmed before. Then we use, have heavy use of encapsulation. What does that mean? So here, I'm telling the image, put your spatial origin in the middle. Down here, when I do a DFT, this is why I didn't write FFT, but I wrote DFT, this algorithm actually takes this spatial origin and adjusts the phase accordingly. You don't have to do that. That is happening automatically. That's what's called encapsulation. We have an orthogonal image and algorithm concept, which means you have an image, but when you do something to it, so for here, you want to randomize the values in the image. The image doesn't care that there's an algorithm run on it. In fact, the image doesn't know anything about the algorithm. It just sits there and is happy. And the algorithms come in and they do something on the image, which means that if you write an algorithm, we don't have to change anything. Uh, it just works automatically. Chaining of algorithms works automatically. And this is in programming terms or in design terms called orthogonal. These two things don't know anything about each other. Then we have this thing, stateful versus stateless algorithms. If you randomize an image, you just assign new values. But here you want to calculate some statistics, which means you generate a result. Where is that result? So in our case, we have an object here that stores the algorithm. You run that with apply, and then you use these member functions to get all the results. Again, it's a clean interface, it's cleanly encapsulated. And most of the documentation that you have to read through when using or programming IPLT is really all these commands, what do they do? And now, you can, you can have an in-place or out-of-place application. Here you see this IP, that means apply this algorithm in-place, so change actually that image. You can also do an apply out-of-place, which is just apply, which means you will generate a results image. You can do both, it doesn't matter, each algorithm works each way. This is a contrast to most other packages which either use in-place or use out-of-place, so you either have a lot of memory use or you keep duplicating your data. Now, on the left is Python, on the right is C++, and they're pretty much identical. Now, they are identical except for some tactic differences that you have to add a semicolon. We don't have a dot, but you have a double colon here, which means that if you, let's say, as the person wearing the structural biology hat, dare to venture and where the methods development had once in a while and you have to program and you get into Python, which is very easy to work. They teach Python at school as the first programming language. So I dare say, yes, you can do that. If you become more and more familiar and suddenly you're faced, you say, oh darn, this algorithm is really too slow. I wish I could program C++. In fact, it's very trivial to take your algorithm and move it into C++. It's another slight hurdle, but it's not a huge jump. And this is something we've been very, very careful in our initial design, that these methods and these methods match. And this is why I pointed out the importance of this Python wrapper, because it's that Python wrapper that makes this particular feature possible. So, where can people contribute? This is another thing, this is our principal design. We want to have a sort of grayscale of contribution possibilities. Because some people have more time, some people have less time. You like to program, you just want to hack your script. So, in all this 
big IPLT, you know, onion-like structure, if you come from this perspective, you just want to run executables. You want to get your, your data um, sold. But let's say you have something tricky, you might be able to uh, <coughs> write some custom Python scripts or even some algorithms. And you can go on and on until you hear the core image state algorithms where all fancy C++ template things go on. And if you like that sort of thing, you're more than welcome to contribute here at the heart. And I, these jumps here going from one to the other are not so difficult to master. So there's a lot of opportunities for people other than us in our little group to contribute. Um, right, so there's only, I think, two slides left. This is a um, sort of teaser for what is to come tomorrow. How have we been using this? So I presented it, of course, the other way around. This is what we have been wanting to do when we sort of built IPLT that we actually could do, but I'll show you now. Um, again, the, the workflow, as, as Brian said, this can't be shown enough to really, um, to really give the people a feeling what we're dealing with. So this scheme here is used as the basis for all of our method development, and it's almost identical to what you've been seeing, except the order of these two steps. Because correction of optical artifacts is, in a way, the CTF correction, and the correction of the crystal distortions is the unbending. And in MRC, that order is reversed. And we'll be hearing tomorrow from Andreas why we think that it might be a good idea to do it this way around. Otherwise, it's the same, you have the unbending here, you extract the information, you scale everything together and you merge it. Here the discretization stands for the lattice line fitting. You get your reflections with your amplitudes and phases. And these here should be phi, so I'm sorry that the Greek font messed up. So you have amplitudes and phases here, and you actually get a um, model which you still have to interpret. And this very innocent little yellow arrow here can actually be a major pain in the butt, but that's not part of this workshop. I mean, you go to workshop just to be able to do this little arrow here. Um, right, so this is the direct imaging that we've been talking about. Tomorrow, I will take you in much more detail through this part, which is the diffraction processing. So I won't go into that. So the two major components, what we have now in IPLT, which we would like you to use as the person wearing the structural biology hat. First of all, we have electron diffraction processing. That's the subject of tomorrow's talk. Then we have also been working on image processing. Um, we have correlation averaging, which is um, this part here. And we implemented that as a proof of principle. And that is working and released. And we use that for students' tutorials all the time. But we also have full image processing in the works, which you see the naming conventions are very similar to the diffraction processing that's ongoing, and we'll be talking about this in 2010 at this workshop here, if we're still in life, I don't know. Now, we have, this is like the, the public code for you to use. Now, we have a lot of internal code for method development, and I just want to highlight these things here. Um, carbon film simulation, the TSIF simulation, that'll be uh, uh, 40 minutes for me tomorrow to show you. Then we test various stripe-based correction schemes for tilt images, uh, detwinning, um, then simulation of 2D crystals in 3D. Andreas will be talking about that, as well as this order of operation for CTF unbending. And all of that is really heavily, heavily using IPLT. Without IPLT, we wouldn't be able to address any of these questions in the fast amount of time that we do. So it, it, it's really the ideal situation for me. We're three, four guys. We have a whiteboard. We chuck down the discussion for two, three, four, five hours, brainstorming session. We have diagrams and we basically sit down and code that into Python. And most of the tests, you know, the bare bone prototyping is done within a day or two. And that really allows us to go through a lot of ideas really fast. So how you get IPLT, or oh, it's the same, it's the same distribution concept as 2DX. It's open source, it's freely available. We're not as sophisticated. It would be better if you just compile it from source, but we do have pre-built packages for the majority of Linux flavors, um, for OS X and for Windows XP. If you want to use it on Windows, please contact me directly and you have to sign some non-frustration agreement because it's, 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 it's done, it compiles, but um, the distribution is difficult because of the weird way that Windows handles libraries and there are some problems in the graphical user interface. And in fact, this is one of the main driving forces where we're going to GT and getting rid of WX. So 
that, that's the motivation to actually be able to have a Windows port. Now, of course, no one here is ever using Windows, so I don't need to say that, but it just in general, it's nice to have all three platforms. We do have a wiki. We just started to have a user and developer mailing list. This is extremely silent right now because most of us that are using it are sitting next to each other and we prefer talking rather than mailing. And we have a, a developer's mailing list. And with that, we have lots of contributors and collaborators that have made it possible for this project to grow this much. These are the people in Basel and you see we collaborate pretty much all over the place. So a big thank goes to all of these people for, uh, for the feedback and thank you for your attention. Thank you.